My understanding is he became involved in the far-right BMP, and I'm quite keen for you to just tell your story a little bit in that regard, really. How did, how did that happen? What were your first steps on the way to extremism? Thanks for having me on, Patrick. Yeah, I, it's, it's no secret that I was a former member of the BNP and active in radical politics from quite a young age. I was 15 years old when I became interested. Um, what I would say is that the issue of mass immigration and Muslim grooming gangs back, back then uh, was the main driver. It's the, the main reason I got interested in that kind of politics. And as anyone who, familiar with this kind of process knows, often the radicalism comes later. You find an organization or a group or of people who talk about the issues you're concerned about. And if you find that there's no sort of moderate outlet for you to talk about those, then often you find yourself in the hands of extremists. Yes, okay. I mean, you can see how that, how that can happen. Frank. Now, uh, so that's, that's essentially, I suppose, the way that you believe that most people do become radicalised. They take those steps. They almost feel, I suppose, would I say, maybe a bit of a kinship? Is that why it can attract people who maybe feel on the fringes of society? Absolutely. I, I propose there's two kinds of um, extremists, uh, more than two, perhaps, but main, maybe two main kinds. One is a joiner, somebody who feels like they need to be part of a community and they might have those feelings for many different reasons. The other is somebody who's motivated by a legitimate grievance, who sees problems and responds to it. Um, the theory that I propose in my book is one of a three-pronged attack. It starts with politicians refusing to talk about difficult issues because they, for whatever reason, feel that they shouldn't or that they might get attacked for it. Then it's sort of amplified by the media who so regularly smears the people who talk about those problems in often less than academic ways. And then finally, it's sort of cemented by gangs of radical progressives who will make your life a misery if you dare to speak up about those problems. Yeah. And I, I did just want to say while I'm on GB News today that what you're doing in talking about difficult issues solves the second part of that three-pronged attack. It gives people a voice. Well, that's, that's literally what I'm trying to do, actually, and I do appreciate you saying that. But, but one, one thing that appears very often, right, and, and I hope people take this in, in the manner that I intend it, because it's not meant to be inflammatory whatsoever, and it's certainly not actually what I personally think. But some people say, well, as long as radical Islamism exists, and it appears as though our governments and whoever are not going to do that much about it, they're trying to sweep it under the rug, then, hey, you're going to get your far-right terrorists as well. And they almost, almost use that as a bit of an excuse. Where do you stand on that? What do you feel about that? Well, you know, it's easy to assume that, um, it's easy to assume that people are just going to stay quiet. Um, it's very difficult to talk about some political issues. And I fear that it's become sort of a point scoring uh, issue. Um, people on the right are so scared of being smeared as far-right extremists to the point where they might say, well, the far-right doesn't actually exist, when the problem really is that it's so often wrongly defined. Um, if we can be honest about it and say, you know, I, I saw that we just saw an 18-year-old who was sentenced to, in the Old Bailey just this week for attempting to kill someone uh, who wasn't white for having sex with a white woman. These problems exist. If we're unwilling to talk about them, if we're unwilling to reach out to the people that are being um, wrapped up in these radical circles, we're never going to solve that. I think we need to have a little bit of compassion about people who deal with real issues on the street and ensure that far-right extremists, white nationalists, violent anti-Semites don't take advantage of those problems. Mm. I quite regularly interview people who work for various de-radicalisation organisations, some of whom were radical Islamists, right? And I tend to ask them this question. I think it's only fair I, I ask the same question to you, which is, how can you ever know if someone's actually been de-radicalised? Well, that's the problem, is it? You know, that's why I think the, the bigger question we need to be asking ourselves is how do we stop it in the first place? One suggestion I would make, particularly with regards to the far right, is I think conservatives or right-leaning people need to have more of a hand in de-radicalizing these people. Let me tell you, when I was in the BNP uh, as a teenager, I remember a report in, I think it was The Telegraph, written by a conservative journalist about me, and it attacked me in exactly the same way that Antifa was attacking me. And in my eyes, at that time, I was just responding to Muslim grooming gangs and mass immigration that was hurting my county. I, f I thought, and I still think, that if that conservative journalist had reached out to me and said, hey, I see what you're saying, but maybe this group is the wrong people to be associating with, maybe there's better ways we can deal with this, I wouldn't have gone down that route. I feel very, very lucky that I didn't go down the route um, of, say, Jack Renshaw and some other people who I knew who were from my hometown. Um, I feel very lucky I didn't go down that route. And I feel like if conservatives had more of a hand 
in talking to young lads who are at risk, then we wouldn't have this issue of knowing whether someone's de-radicalised in the first place. What's your thoughts on the role that prison can have in respect to de-radicalisation? Because I made a point earlier on, it does seem to me as though there are a lot of cases where people go into prison potentially as petty criminals and come out maybe, uh, uh, you know, a member of Mujahideen, for example, pretty much. You know, how, how can prison actually affect it the other way? Can prison actually de-radicalise people? Well, you know, prisons by no means uh, an expertise of mine. But what I would say is that prison has to be more than just punishment. Um, we can't pretend that radicalism typically occurs in a void. It often doesn't. It's motivated by a grievance, a legitimate grievance, or perhaps even a perceived grievance. And if we can use prison as an opportunity to reach out to these people and talk about those grievances, those issues that drove them to those dark, dark places in the first place, then perhaps that's how we solve this. Perhaps that's the way we know if someone's de-radicalized. Although, of course, some monsters are just monsters and there's nothing you can do about it, unfortunately. Jack, thank you very much for imparting your, your knowledge on that particular topic onto the show. I really appreciate thank you coming you. on. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favorite shows and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.